Hey, indie filmmakers, I'm Griffin Hammond. I'm Nick Bodmer, and today we're talking about lighting setups and how Griffin was able to film socially distanced interviews while traveling. Plus, I have a simple lighting trick I want to share with you that I've been using on a lot of my recent videos. Ooh, I love a good trick. <laughs> It's, it's similar to my invisible microphone trick, so we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the light is in the shot, is what you're going to tell me. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> kind of. Did I just give the whole trick away? Thanks for coming, everybody. It's been a great episode. No. Actually, we did get a, a comment from uh, Terme Bergamo, longtime listener and viewer of the podcast, who says, Hey, Nick, the lighting setup in your office is better than ever. In our last episode, because it was Halloween, I was using a green gel to, to splash green light onto my curtains today i'm doing blue so maybe we don't harmonize as well uh well i've got orange and blue going which isn't too bad i don't think and you have kind of the blue light is acting like as a kind of a backlight so my lighting setup is thus i have in if you cut out you can actually see the umbrella in my shot a little bit so i've got um uh, i guess you'd call it a key light is that true my main light yeah. It's uh, behind my computer monitors with an umbrella on it, just shooting white light at my face. I have in the background, I have that bookcase that sits behind me, and that has yeah. an LED um, strip light around it that I can change the color of, and I have it set to an orange. And then off to my right, I have one of my LED lights set to a blue color, and it's it's pointed at the background, but enough that it also is hitting my face. So it's kind of on a diagonal and just oh, picking okay. up the, the off side of my face and filling it in. So it's not like reflecting color. off the background and hitting you. It's actually like hitting both you and the background. Equally. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Are, I'm curious, do you use all of these lights or any of these lights when you're just doing like a Zoom call for work, or is that overkill? <laughs> I, I ha it is overkill, but yes, I have. Been. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same way. I've been using all of my lighting. I definitely it's use like a backlight while I'm doing Zoom calls because I don't think people would recognize that a backlight is even happening. But they're like, <laughs> it like makes me pop. <laughs> I get some good comments. I do have a tendency to leave my room overhead lights on too, though, so it kind of tones down the colors and the effect. Yeah. But it's still, you know, I get some nice depth, and people say it looks nice. You know, except well, for yeah, this camera. I overheating like crazy it'd be a a perfect setup yeah. i as i was turning on my lights for this shoot right now i was looking in the camera and i was like this looks more yellow than usual and sure enough it was the overhead lights in the room that were still on i always have to remember to turn those off yes indeed color temperature for the win <laughs> so my setup is it's funny now that i'm out of my urban apartment and i have more space uh and actually it's a weird kind of juxtaposition with my old shot. Now that I have more space, I can use more lights, but I also have an uglier space than I'm in. Like I used to really love taking advantage of like the brick walls in my New York yeah. apartment. Uh, so now I'm trying to like make an ugly space look prettier and I get to use all of my lights now. So I have, it's funny cause I've like for years, I thought three point lighting was just like overkill for the kind of run and gun stuff I do. And now I'm using like four lights for this setup. <laughs> I have my, my key light is a setup that I use all the time, which is my, my Westcott flex light. It's an led panel and it's just pointed at the wall. So just like you, you're diffusing your light with an umbrella. I'm diffusing my light by just bouncing it off the wall. So instead of a, a one by one foot square light, it becomes like a, three foot square light when it's bounced off the wall and it makes a really flattering look on my face. And then I have three aperture 120D lights going. The one of them is just pointed at the wall, which uh, is just kind of a nice accent for this like blue curtain I have. So what the 120D, is that kind of just like a spotlight type of a thing? Yeah. What, what are those? Yeah, they're just, uh, they're just, I guess they're called COBs, uh, which I actually completely forget what the acronym means. Um, but yeah, they're just like spotlights. They're LED powered spotlights. Okay. Um, and so good to throw on the wall or into a reflector or something, but probably not something you point straight at a subject. Right. Although I have bounced it the same way that I'm bouncing the Westcott off the wall. I have just completely shown a 120D onto the wall before and just turned the wall into a, um, a soft box. Okay. Um, but also I have behind me this uh, light dome, which normally 
if I only had one light, I love a really soft key light. So normally I would just like let the, the light dome kind of sit in front of me and, and wrap light around my face. It's really, it looks really nice. That's the one that's got all the little div black dividers like crisscrossing it. Yes. And the problem is in this setup, I'm, I'm, I have my desk pushed all the way up against the wall. So really I can only do this wall bounce effect. I couldn't mm -hmm. fit this giant light dome in front of me. So because the room is kind of boring and also because I have some stuff I strategically need to block, there's just like some shelves on the wall that don't look very exciting. They have like kids, you know, like gloves for Peter on the wall and stuff. <laughs> uh, I have this light dome set up in the background and I kind of started doing it. I think maybe it was an accident that I had it back there, but I realized when I'm shooting at F1.4 on this 12 millimeter lens and I throw it out of focus, that black grid and the lighting coming out of that light, it just looks kind of interesting, really out of focus. Yeah. So I've, I've thrown that in, in the background. And then I also have a, um, here, I can flip that on and off. So real quick, is the light from that actually being used to light you at all, or is it just like really low just to add some interest to the frame? It's actually really low. And what's I think what's interesting about the shot is that I also have just out of frame a backlight that's throwing light on my shoulder and, and the side of my face. But I like this combination of putting a practical light in the shot and then kind of making it seem like it's creating the backlight. Right. Like normally this is something I might do with a window. Like if I had a window next to me, I could also throw a backlight on me and it just kind of looks like, oh, the sun's coming through the window and it's lighting up your, your shoulder. I think that's probably what it looks like when I do a Zoom call this way. Whereas if you actually had that light bright enough to throw that backlight, it would just, it would blow out in frame basically. I think so. Yeah, actually yeah. I have, I have, not only do I have a blue gel on my accent light on the wall, I have a quarter CTO gel on my backlight. So it's just a little bit more yellow. I don't need it to be super blue light hitting my shoulder. Uh, and then I have a full CTO going on the light behind me. Uh, also with an, it's actually a CTO gel with a built-in ND. So it's actually knocking the light down and making okay. it a little bit warmer. Cause I, yeah, I think it would look less interesting if it was just like white. It's kind of golden coming out of that light. That's cool. Yeah, uh, so this is my this is kind of my normal setup for right now for the podcast and for all the videos that I do for the recount. But I I did want to share this trick that I do when I do this setup that I think. Oh, I, I thought that was the trick. The trick <laughs> the hasn't trick. come you yet. You thought the trick was putting the the, the light in light. the frame. Yeah. yeah. Oh no, man. The, the problem excited. with this is I have this big room and. But with all these lights going, I'm, I'm bouncing a lot of light off the walls and the ceiling and everything. And so in some cases there's light where I don't want it, or actually a lot of times I'm doing this shoot during daytime and there's sunlight coming through the, the curtains and there's just a lot of light behind me. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the backlight does a nice job of separating me from the background, but if there's too much light in the background, I'm not that separated from the background. And also, like I said, this is not the most beautiful room. I have like, there's a hole yeah. in the floor and <laughs> like, it's just like 50 year old flooring in here. And so there's like a, like a few chips in the floor and just some ugly things in the background. So I've thought about in post kind of, you know, doing like a vignette and darkening the edges, but actually what I think is more fun and you can do this anytime you're on a tripod and you have lighting that's on light stands is I've just gotten in the habit of, at the end of my shoot, I turn off all the lights. I actually have them all on this aperture remote, which is kind of fun. Uh, I'll leave the key light on, but I, I turn off all my little backlights. And then I just I just step out of frame for like 10 seconds. Get a dark, clean plate, basically. <laughs> yeah, so then I have a, a plate of a much darker version of the shot. And then in post, I just take, I kind of make that the vignette. So I'm not actually you kind of feather it in basically. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not like artificially darkening the shot. I'm actually showing you exactly what it would look like in the dark at the edges of the frame. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I like that. I have to be careful not to like uh, go too far or move my hands too much. wildly. Yeah. But generally if I'm staying in the center of the frame, I can kind of do that to the edges um, and just kind of focus your, your visual attention to the middle of the frame some more. 
Interesting. Well, that's clever. And I find I do that a lot with just like, you know, if I'm doing the one light, like if I'm doing the dome, the light dome, I probably want this nice soft light on my subject. But if I'm in a small office or something, it might be throwing light in places that I don't want it to be lighting up the background more than I want, lighting up the edges of the room. And so this little trick can help you kind of have the best of both worlds. I love it. I hit my mic. I was so excited. <laughs> So you've been doing some interviews in the pandemic, huh? Yeah, actually, I mean, for it's been a long time <laughs> since I was on the campaign trail. Because the pandemic trail. never ends. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's I, you know, I I was traveling in February, uh, shooting stuff for the election, and I kind of thought that was going to be it because uh, I just haven't been on the campaign trail since then. And then my boss asked me if I wanted to come on this trip across the country. Uh, I was actually joining a another tv crew this was uh the circus they the show on showtime that covers the election and they already had a private jet chartered that they were going to jump around the country uh, no big to try deal. to do yeah no big deal <laughs> i mean this this is a crew that that was covid free they were testing frequently uh and, and operating as a pod and following covid protocols during their their shoot and they had an extra seat on this plane that they chartered. And so they asked me if I wanted to come along and, and shoot some uh, almost essentially behind the scenes. I was just kind of shooting some fast turn stuff to go on uh, my company's website on the recount. And, but I had to take a COVID test to join them because they yeah. were all healthy and I'm negative, which was good. But, uh, this was the first time I've had to shoot in this, in, in this situation. And so my first thought as I was packing is like, well, I can't bring like lav mics. Like I don't want to, if I'm doing a two person interview, I don't want to have to like walk up to someone and hook them up with a mic. I mean, I probably could. I'm going to have to pause you real quick right there. Sounds like Nick just got a package. Griffin, I got a surprise, but we'll talk about that <laughs> later. Okay. <laughs> surprise. You're going to, you're going to hold on to this surprise package for the end of the podcast. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Stick around and find out what's in the package from the What's in the box? <laughs> Sorry, I had to sign for it. You know how it goes. Yeah. I totally cut you off. You're not going to use lav mics. That'd be crazy. You'd have to get right in somebody's face. So what do you pack? Well, yeah, so I, I decided the, you know, I was trying to find this balance of like, what's the, the smallest gear I can bring, but also I need to be able to shoot these two person conversations and I want to do it safely. So I ended up bringing my, I have like a wireless Sennheiser stick mic. And so I pretty much just gave this to my, the host and just yeah. let him hold on to it. And that way I always had a wireless connection to him. But then, you know, every time we were interviewing someone, you know, they're not going to already have a mic going. So I decided what to do is take my little Asden shotgun mic. This is the 250 CX that I, I still love this mic. And I have this little, I don't know what company this is, Pearstone or something. I have a little, yeah, Pearstone articulating arm that I use for this mic a lot. It's, okay. I think it's only about a foot long, uh, but it bends in different directions. And I just put my little Peak Design quick release plate on the bottom. And so as I would, as I was getting ready for a shoot to start, I would just set up the Peak Design tripod, throw this microphone on top, John, the host, would already have his his mic, and then I had a little. I had my audio recorder like on a shoulder strap, and I could just start. I would be plugged into one mic with like a like a twenty five foot XLR, and then wirelessly connected to the other mic, and I could just stand ten feet away from both these people and and film them. But they're both mic. So essentially, the guest would just walk up to this mic setup that I had placed in advance. Perfect. How would you would kind of set the camera, hit record, and walk away then too? I assume the or was the camera farther back with you? No, I actually I didn't even want to be. I didn't even want to have that much gear. I didn't even bring a tripod for the camera. I was handheld on the camera, but I was shooting with my twenty five millimeter f one four, uh huh, which allowed me to stand far enough away from everyone. I was probably ten feet away from each of the people 
you know, we're, we're standing essentially like a triangle, like the and two people talking to each other. you have a wide shot with that lens then, right? You're seeing like Well, no, the, the, 12, the 25 or? millimeter, at that distance, I could get like a medium shot of each person. Oh, this person. is on your GH5, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's a, a little bit of a crop, so yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and so I found that lens worked well for this because these really had to be quick running gun videos. I didn't have time to cut in two shots. And mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out how can I do this lightweight, but also safe. And so what I ended up doing, I mean, it's not, it's not the most beautiful way to shoot a two person interview, but for something that I wanted to turn quickly and, and low amount of editing, I was just standing between these two people in our little triangle. And I would just whip pan back and forth between the host as he's asking a question. Then I would swing over <laughs> and, uh, you know, I and, watched some of those cuts and maybe you, you can show them on the screen. I was wondering if you were hiding cuts in there or not. Oh, definitely. I was hiding cuts. Yeah. Okay. So, but they looked you know, really what, good. <laughs> some of these videos were, they're supposed to be like a minute long, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, like a, a fast round of questions, but inevitably they would go two minutes long if someone's qu answer was too long uh, or the question would become too long or there'd be big pauses between the questions and answers. And so to speed the whole thing up, I would just take out some pauses, cut out the bad parts of the answers. And that gave me the flexibility to, you know, during a whip pan, I might just cut straight to the middle of a question. Uh, and you don't really feel that edit too much. Right. Or I could. I, I I definitely when I was watching was going back and forth like, are they, are these cuts or? Yeah, I just couldn't <laughs> tell. I couldn't tell. It felt like yeah. everything was too tight for it not to be, but it didn't right. visually look like it. So that was cool. And I would usually capture at least one wide shot of the two of them, so you could get your bearings, you could understand what was going on, and maybe I'd get a secondary shot, kind of over a, sh a shoulder or something, as something else to cut away to. But uh, but generally, I kind of just. You know, I had to make, I made like 18 videos over three days that were this style. That's and crazy. So I just kind of got into a rhythm where I was like, you know, I don't really need cutaways. The audience will forgive me. And this is the quickest way to do this and make it look nice. Because at least with the F14 lens and deep backgrounds, we're shooting most of these things outside. I, and if I stood equidistant between them, I wouldn't have to refocus. All right. Uh, just whipping back and forth throws the background the backgrounds out of focus and they look nice and sharp. I you know, I had to use a pretty heavy N D filter to do outdoor shooting with F one four. I think I was probably using at least like a, a six stop N D in sunlight. Yep. But yeah, I that that was a, a setup that worked for me. I felt good about keeping that distance from everyone and you know, I could wipe off the microphones afterward with Lysol wipes and I was wearing gloves and a mask the whole time. This sounds tough. Uh, and then you are turning these around like as quick as you could, right? Like next time you got on the plane, you would just, you know, edit a couple and yeah, get we, them up as soon as we got into this rhythm or... where we shoot like three videos in one state. Like we started uh -huh. this trip in Texas and then we flew to Iowa and then to Montana, I think in the same day. And so when we're on the plane to Iowa, I'd be editing the three videos from Texas. And yep. by the time we land in Iowa, I would sit. I'm finally back on the internet and I would send them off to be reviewed by my boss and they'd sign off on them. They'd publish them. And then I'm already shooting the next three videos in Iowa. <laughs> and then when we're on the plane to Montana, I'm editing the next, but because we kept them so simple, I was able to complete three edits on a, you know, a one hour flight because, uh, it was really just like add the opening intro music, cut out a few things and then, uh, that's awesome. the ending. That is so yeah. cool. It felt good to be doing like a very simple project like that. I think yeah. after so many months of just doing these very complicated edits to get out on the road and be doing a lot of shooting again felt really inspiring. And then to be able to turn so many things so quickly, it was really fun. So actually I didn't, I didn't feel tired on this trip. It was kind of an adrenaline boost that I think I needed after all this time being, at home. Being quarantined for so long. Mm -hmm. I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsor. And right after that, we're going to take a question from the audience. Plus, Nick has some Apple news to go through. And we have to open your surprise package. Secret package. Hey, Indie Filmmakers is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your filmmaking business. 
I was thinking about how in this socially distanced time that we're in, you know, movie theaters are still closed, film festivals have gone all virtual, that this would be a great time for you to start your own film festival if you were so inclined that there's nothing geographic that has to bind you. You can make a film festival open to the world. And right now you could build a website that collects admission fees or submission fees from filmmakers. You can use the e-commerce tools on a Squarespace site to do that. You could set up a portfolio to show off the winning films. There's not much of a barrier to starting your own film festival. And I think with a Squarespace site, you could probably do the whole thing in like an hour. All the tools you need are right there. So check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash griffin to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So Nick, would you like to read this question that we got? Yeah, we have a question from Matthew. How do I interview a congressman as a solo shooter and have them feel and think I'm worthy of their time and can make it look professional? This person has experienced what a true budgeted interview setup is like, and I can't compete with that. How do you manage it? I have an A7S III, he's a former Panasonic S1 user, tripod, Rode Wireless Go. I was thinking of renting a C-stand and diffusion grid and plan to shoot outside. How do you normally do this, Griffin? Well, my first piece of advice to Matthew was don't get too starstruck by a congressman because there are <laughs> 435 members of the U.S. Congress and some of them are idiots. <laughs> I mean, almost anyone could get elected to Congress. Uh, I mean, you know, some some districts are more competitive than others, but these are normal people, and they they have a lot of experience being interviewed by journalists who don't always bring the most exciting gear. I'm sure he's been interviewed by on an iPhone recently. Uh, so I, I told Matthew his A7S III might be one of the fanciest cameras that <laughs> this congressman may see in a while. Yeah. Um, and then my second piece of advice was not to make this too complicated, that this person will not care about what equipment you have, but if you bring a C-stand and diffusion, diffusion grid and you're trying to set up all this gear that you rented that you're not that familiar with and it's taking you a really long time to set it up, that's more likely to piss this person off if they're waiting for you to f figure something out or you'll make some dumb mistake. Like a lot of times if I introduce new gear, I might forget to focus on my camera or like forget to hit <laughs> record or something uh, basic with the audio. Uh, so my, my advice was just to, just to keep it simple. And I actually heard back from him. He did the, the shoot. He said it looked great. It went really well. He decided not to bring all that extra gear and he was happy he didn't because like he just went under a tree and got some really nice diffusion from that. The lighting looked great on his subject and he got all this beautiful, you know, it's like a lake behind him and shot turned out perfect good job matthew all right quick hit on apple news now do you remember last time we talked about the new apple m1 processors do you recall yeah and they made some fairly wild claims about performance but the first m1 laptops are in people's hands and they are very impressive so apple released three new computers a new macbook air a new mac mini and a new 13-inch MacBook Pro that all right. have the same M1 processor. Um, and So they have they yet to, presumably they'll eventually give the M1 to a 16-inch MacBook and to the, the iMacs, but we're just not that, there yet? That's right, yep. Yeah, they've yeah. said they'll transition their entire line over two years, which you know started six months ago, so in the next year yeah. and a half or so. By the end of next year, I would expect everything has transitioned over. But this, so this new MacBook Air has no fan, all right? The Mac, current MacBook Air has a fan, but this MacBook Air has no fan, so it's 100% silent. And it, in single core, is the fastest Mac ever made compared to every Mac before it, including iMacs, including iMac Pros, including Mac Pros. <laughs> in single core, it's the fastest. And in multi-core, um, it's faster than any laptop they've ever made, even like the $5,000 macbook pro 16 inch with the i9 and eight cores and all that um this little macbook air with no fan uh is faster than all those laptops and it holds its own against the imac pro and the mac pro at least the, well, yeah, I've the seen, lower spec i've seen these mac videos Pros. of people doing renders on on m1 Macs, and they're they're super fast like are you telling me that if i went out and got this macbook air would it render something faster than my imac pro that i have in front of me 
Um, that uh, your, how many cores is your iMac Pro? <laughs> I don't know. Let me look. It would be very close, is what it would be. Yeah, very close. Yeah. And it would do it silently, a, and it would do it with a battery that is significantly longer than any uh, previous right. MacBook possible. My my work computer is an iMac Pro with a 3.2 gigahertz Intel 8 core processor and 32 gigs of yeah, RAM. Yeah, the, the MacBook Air is gonna is gonna hold its own on export times, yeah. which is just nuts, right? <laughs> right. Well, and and the the other thing, not to make this sound like a big Apple commercial, but like also just looking at their product lineups. They're, it seems like they're able to bring the cost down too. Yeah, I think the the MacBook Air is about the same price it always has been, but it's certainly significantly more capable than it was before. Um, right. Yeah, I guess just Mac I was comparing like a little bit the current oh. like the MacBook Air against like you know considering it's faster than like an old MacBook Pro, uh, you know that you probably spent three thousand or thirty five hundred on. What was the, the the MacBook Air can be like a thousand dollars. Nine ninety nine is where it starts. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it's smaller, but uh, so a couple things to watch out for. Um, the MacBook Air, Mac Mini, MacBook Pro that they've released. This MacBook, this thirteen inch MacBook Pro, it really kind of replaces that low end thirteen inch MacBook Pro that they've had that only has two ports. That's why they're still selling like an Intel version of a thirteen inch iMac Pro because you can't do more than sixteen gigs of you RAM. Mean, you mean MacBook Pro? What did I say? iMac Pro. Yeah, I meant I meant MacBook Pro. Thank you. But yeah, um, I knew you were talking so, about. So I, I know, like Griffin. You asked me the other day. You know, you had somebody asking you. You know, what's a good? You know, they were looking at a 16-inch MacBook Pro, and it's like, unless you absolutely need something, do not buy <laughs> any of these Intel right. Macs. I wouldn't do it. The because like especially in a laptop, three months, there could the, be a new. With the, oh yeah, it, it'll be it'll be first half next year probably. Um, and yeah. If this is how fast these super low end ones are, when they like double the core count or something, we don't know what they're going to do. But I would expect that the 16 inch MacBook Pro replacement and the iMac replacement are going to blow us the freak away. So keep your eyes yeah. open for that. I'm I'm very excited. The whatever iMac they announce will probably be my my next computer. I've had this uh, Mac Mini that I've been using for a long time, but I, I want one of these Macs. So just wanted to put that out there it's very exciting stuff yeah i'm it's super cool i don't think i need anything anytime soon although i my macbook pro would be the next thing to refresh but it's it's doing fine but i'm certainly gonna be jealous when the next macbook pro is severely outperforming my imac pro yeah yeah it's it's a kind of a crazy crazy world we're going to be living in here as as these come out so um, yeah. The big big thing you lose though is no, you can't do boot camp to boot into Windows, and right now virtualization of Windows is not an option either. So if you have re rely on Windows on your Mac for anything, that's the big downside right now. So yeah, yeah, I saw some review that was kind of like if you're relying on a lot of weird apps, like uh, you may need to wait for Apple to to work out some of the translation bugs in what do they call that? Rosetta. Rosetta, yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, in, unless you use something really obscure, it sounds like Rosetta works crazy good, so I wouldn't worry about it too yeah. much. Griffin, I'm opening the package. It's package yeah. opening time. So, so after your last, after the last episode, we were talking about your camera situation, yeah. and you were thinking maybe you could use a camera that doesn't have a 30-minute recording limit and overheating problem. Oh, it's tiny. So remind dun, dun. remind the audience what camera you're shooting on at the moment. So I'm shooting on a Sony A7 III, uh, which has a 30 minute recording limit, which is super annoying for this podcast because I do things like hit stop halfway through and hit start again to get started out, and you know yeah. it does overheat. So Sony announced the Sony A7C, which is basically all the guts of an a7 III in terms of like image quality and stuff it's exactly the same but um it's more compact so you lose a few features that i'm don't use heavily and uh it's supposedly has a, a better cooling system it can still overheat but but less so and it has no record time limit so i'm swapping yeah. the a7 III to the a7c that won't focus but that's okay there it is so this just came for those mail. of a, for for people watching this on YouTube, uh, can can we see the? I think you got the 
the black one with like there's a, a silver, oh, silver accent trim. on top. Yeah, let's let's get into it, shall we? Well, I, I'm, I'd love to hear in the comments, would people have ordered the black one or the black one with the silver trim? <laughs> I mean, you, <laughs> you can agree tell, with Nick's choice. You can tell everybody, Griffin, that I was like texting you, like sending you pictures of both. Like, which do I get? Like, normally I just go all <laughs> black because that's like Screams Pro. But uh, the, the silver looked a little retro in a way that I that I liked. So, yeah, there it is. you know, what's funny is. I think one of the reasons I wanted you to get the silver one is I still have a lot of nostalgia for my first digital camera that I feel like I was a junior, maybe a sophomore in high school that, when I got it. The Mavica that uh, took floppy disks? No, this was even before that. I, but I think before that even came out, I got a camera. I think I bought it at Circuit City, actually. And Classic. Which, do they even exist Classic anymore? Classic Circuit City. I don't think so. Uh, and... I remember the model name and everything. It's the Toshiba PDR M1. Oh, wow. And it, this was like a little digital camera. It had like, I think it had like a one and a half inch screen or something. And it took, it was a precursor to SD cards. I don't remember what they were called. They were like little thin, they were like the old style floppy disks, but like really small flash cards or something. What were they called? Yeah, I don't know. I don't even know. Yeah. I'm sorry. I think it was probably eight megabytes or something. <laughs> it took like what, half but, a megapixel pictures or something? Yeah, I mean, yeah, tiny pictures. But uh, in fact, I, I should show one of those old pictures, like what I looked like at the time. I looked completely different because I was so young. But I just have a lot of nostalgia for like the form factor, the weight of this thing. It just looked beautiful to me. And there's something about the silver on the top of your camera that just kind of reminds me of that. It is it is smaller in the hand than the A7 III. You know, once you get a big full frame Sony lens on there, it probably is pretty similar in size and weight. But if I throw one of my little pancake lenses on here, I think I might enjoy walking around with this. Oh, and here's the other thing. Because right now what I do is I have my A7 III hooked up to a computer so I can actually monitor the output and set my settings and make sure I'm exposing it right. This has a screen that flips around like magic. So it's going to dramatically oh, the, simplify. Your other one didn't? Setup. No, I can't see the that, screen. Yeah, that is a big deal. Yeah. So uh, this has been a... I, I love the Sony. I think it looks phenomenal. Um, but it's definitely been a compromise in terms of ergonomics while shooting as a one-man band. So yeah. I think this is going to be fun. I'll let you know if I hate the fact that I... So like... Um, I lose the second dial, so like you know, to do sh shutter and aperture independently. Um, the EVF is not nearly oh. as good; it's a lot smaller. Um, you lose like the joystick and a bunch of the custom buttons, which, but I just never use that stuff. I'm pretty vanilla, so. Well, yeah, like well, half you know, the stuff you next shoot is probably what I think. Half half of what you shoot is probably the podcast, where it's on a tripod and you're not even behind the camera to to touch exactly. any of those buttons. Exactly. So. We'll see. Should be good. You still there? That's all I got, Griffin. That's an episode, I think. What do you think? I think I lost you for 10 seconds. <laughs> ah, you know, probably why? Because my phone's ringing, and the iPhone has a new feature where it'll, like, move your AirPods over to whatever device is in use. It happened oh. to me a couple times thus far, so hopefully you can hear me now. But I've just been talking away, so we're good. <laughs> I was going to ask you to remind the audience what lens you're using uh, for the podcast that you will continue, uh, presumably. Good question. It's the Samyang or Ro Rokinon. I think those are the same brand with different names. Um, 24 millimeter f2.8. Yeah. Uh, I also have the 35 millimeter version of that lens, which I use uh, for Zoom meetings and stuff, just a little tighter. Then I've got the Sony 50 millimeter f1.8 and 85 f1.8 are kind of my go-to. And then I've got a, I got a bunch of other lenses, but those. So are you'll the probably keep the all your lenses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No change. Just, you think you'll sell the the other Sony? Oh yes, dear God, yes. Yeah, they're about the same price, <laughs> and I'm hoping, um, you know, to fetch a decent price for the for this Sony, um, which should mostly cover the cost of of the new one. So couple hundred bucks probably to to upgrade slash downgrade yeah. that's where i'm at griffin i don't know maybe i'm crazy i'm just i'm just so happy that we get to open the the suspense box and 
It worked perfect. I t- before we started, I said, Griffin, there's a chance FedEx is going to come while we're recording. And he's like, oh, no, that would actually probably be cool. And he was right. Yeah. It was cool. I uh, I want to apologize to the audience for a, a production mistake I made in this episode, which was that it's cold in my office. And I realized like 10 minutes ago that I still had my heater going, <laughs> my space heater going, <laughs> which I think I'll be able to remove some of that background just noise just denoise that baby right out yeah but uh, there's probably some uh, some humming going on right below me mm-hmm. <laughs> it's okay. cold in here that's actually my biggest work problem is that my fingers get way colder than the rest of my body i just have like thin fingers and and so all this typing those, like fingerless and, gloves maybe so while you're sitting there working you can warm up your yeah. hands yeah I need like really thin fingerless gloves for working. Yeah, I should probably I'll let Amy know like so she has a Christmas idea for you. Yeah, because if I don't if I don't keep my, the area around me warm enough, then I just like cease to be able to edit. I can't <laughs> type on the keys anymore. <laughs> well, that's not a problem in my office because I have three computers on my desk. I've got two servers in the closet and a Synology. My office mm. is always 10 degrees warmer than the rest of the room, so I'm sweating. You're also in Nevada, and I'm. it's snowing here today in Illinois. The weather here is... Ooh, the suspense. It built 62 degrees. Yeah. It's a quite chilly. A chilly Nevada day. <laughs> All right, well, my friend. Should... I should let you go. It was great talking to you. It was great talking to you. And we will see you all next time. Bye-bye. We should take a quick break. A break? A break.